In the 1920s, Alfred Sloan, who was the president of General Motors, would introduce the companionship make program. All General Motors makes would get a companionship make except for Chevy and General Motors. And in 1929, Pontiac was the companionship make to Oakland. But before getting into all of it, I'm Jay. Welcome to What It's Like, the automotive channel where we talk about cars, not the weather. History, specs, design. Sometimes it's like seeing these cars for the very first time. We post between four and five episodes each week with engine episodes generally on Wednesdays. If that sounds of interest, a channel that you will totally dig, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. Wait a second. You hear that? Spring is finally here. If you have a cool car in your personal collection, maybe you're affiliated with a museum, maybe you have a consignment automotive dealer that has cool cars and you'd like to see them featured on the channel, drop me a line at what underscore it's underscore like at yahoo.com if interested. Pontiac would first appear in 1926. Actually, let's take a step back for a second. Alfred Sloan became president of General Motors in 1923, replacing DuPont. Sloan saw pricing gaps in General Motors marketing structure to fill those gaps and offer more cars at various price points. Alfred Sloan came up with the companionship make program. All General Motors makes would get a companionship make except for General Motors and Chevy. It's also worth pointing out that the companionship makes didn't all come out the same year. Pontiac would be unveiled at the New York Auto Show in 1926 as a lower-priced model to Oakland. LaSalle was next, introduced in March of 1927, which was the lower-priced alternative to Cadillac. Viking would come next in March of 1929. It was the only make to be over the original company slotted above Oldsmobile. Marquette was Buick's companionship make, introduced on June 1st of 1929 for the 1930 model year. So GM's model lineup would look like this. Chevy at the bottom, followed by Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Marquette, Oakland, Viking, Buick, LaSalle, and Cadillac at the top. Timing wasn't good though. More cars isn't always the answer. The 20s was a pretty good decade with a couple of market bleeps, but the major one came in 1929 when the major stock market crash happened. So a lot of those car companies, they only had one or two years. Marquette only lasted one year and was gone by the end of 1930. Viking would be gone after 1931. Pontiac, we will come back to Pontiac. LaSalle would last until 1940. LaSalle comprised of around 65% of Cadillac's total output. So LaSalle had a replacement, the Series 61. Pontiac had the adverse effect. General Motors couldn't keep all of those brands around. They just wasn't making money during the Great Depression. So they decided to switch Pontiac and Oakland. Oakland was discontinued in 1931. Pontiac was the only make General Motors ever conjured up to survive as long as it did, being discontinued in 2010. It's ironic, though, because it died during the Great Recession. It survived the Depression, but the recession got it. 1929, Pontiac model lineup was broken down into in three series but known collectively as the Big Six Series 6-29. 6-28 was carried over from 1928 with very few changes. Artillery, wood spoke wheels go from 12 spoke to thicker 10 spoke design. There's a bit of conflicting information with the models that come after the 6-28. 6-29A, radiator has a chrome bar that goes through the center first split two grill design Pontiac would become known for. Also, the hood has horizontal louvers. Later on, they would introduce a new model called the 6-29B, which would replace the horizontal louvers on the hood with vertical ones, first appearing in January of 1929. 1929 Pontiac, now styled, derived from British Vauxhall, bullet-shaped headlights, Closed cars have oval windows. 1929 was the last year for Pontiac to do the half-year carryover thing. 1929, Pontiac could be had as, but not limited to, Phaeton, Coupe, Cabriolet, Sedan. 
Let's talk specs. 169 inches long. It rides a wheelbase of 110 inches. It weighs 2,540 pounds. Price $845, which is equivalent to you spending $15,433.95 in the year 2024. Total 1929 Pontiac production was 120,000 units, which that's a big number for 1929. Moving on to engine, only one engine on offer for this car, 200 cubic inch displacement, split head six, 3.3 liters. It's good for 60 horsepower, 3,000 RPM. This is an estimate, 105 pound feet or 142 Newton meters around 1,800 RPM with a bore of 3.3 inches and a stroke of 3.9 inches. Compression is 4.9 to one. Three main bearings built of cast iron. This engine features a split head, counterweighted crankshaft with harmonic balancer, larger intake manifold, larger valves with increased lift, 20% increased in power. This was also the very first year for Pontiac to offer four-wheel mechanical brakes that were self-energizing, backed with a three-speed manual transmission. This absolutely stunning 1929 Pontiac 6-29 is currently for sale at Classic Auto Mall, Morgantown, Pennsylvania, where they have this car as well as 900 other cars for sale. Get this, anybody can go there to peruse their inventory, whether that be online or in person. For more information, pricing, and pictures pertaining to this very car, be sure to click the link below after the show. Let's talk styling. Look at these fenders. Look at how they're just very basic it's domed here has a bead that runs around here it's around the perimeter and how it's connected to the car leaf springs in the front here notice the frame comes all the way out to here and connects with the leaf spring It's got bias ply tires here in the front. Notice how thin they are. The lights are absolutely massive. There's my hand for reference. My hand is seven and a half inches long. So that gives you a reference of how big these lights are. Tilt ray headlamps. Notice how they are mounted. It has this bar that goes across which the other headlight is also mounted to. Beautiful grill. This looks like nickel. Look at that Pontiac mascot. Absolutely gorgeous. And that's what I mean. Cars today, they don't have this kind of detail. They don't even have hood ornaments. And they were willing to do all this kind of detail back then. Also look at in the radiator shell itself, all the different lines, this line here in the center, how all the lines come together and go down the radiator shell. This one has pedigree, first national prize, antique auto club of America winner. This hole down here is for the crank. If you wanted to hand crank it, you could. Why anybody would want to do that is beyond me. If I couldn't get the car started, I'd put it up on top of a hill and just kickstart it. But that's just me. Bumpers, just two basic bars with a piece here in the center. Connected. This car is like, I don't know if you'd call it a chartreuse green, maybe a, it's like a greenish tannish color, pinstriping, which is awesome. It accents the color beautifully. Also has this raised section here on the hood that has this orange pinstripe to it. 
Just look at how this protrudes the rest of the body. Very nice. More accent trim here, but it doesn't connect over there. Also notice the hinges are bright. This one has cow lights on both sides. It's like accessory lights. This one has side mounts on both sides as well. And they are connected with this clamp more or less. It also sits down inside the fender. But just look at how those fenders are designed. The fender, the fender flows down into this running board here. It has this beautiful step pad. Check out how this is like pressed in. They could have just made it flat. Like they would have done today if they made this car today. But it gives it character, I think. It's my foot for reference. I wear size 12 shoe. It does taper in the back a little bit. This car does have an external sun visor. Look at how it's attached. Also has an accessory light here. More pinstriping. Getting inside. So just look at this door panel and it's really soft mohair. Lock and unlock the door, window crank for the big window, which operates like this. And I'm not gonna put it all the way up because it seems like it's, it's gonna take a little while. It's all framed out, but also notice with this door that it's not, the door isn't framed out, just the window is. And when it meets up with the body of the car, this is the other part of the frame for the door, if that makes any sense. It's just like an L shape. See how that works? This is the door handle to get out. Coming down inside the pedal box down here. High beam switch, clutch, brake, gas pedal, starter is up there. Emergency brake and or hand brake, gear selector. Just take a look at this interior. It's really, really nice. Seats are super comfortable. Here is what over the hood would look like. Here's what first person over the hood would look like. On to the button switches and knobs, starting on the left and moving right. Coolant temperature gauge, headlights, key, oil pressure, ignition, amp meter, speedometer, which notice it spins. The numbers spin and the needle stays stationary. Odometer, tripometer, Two silver things that protrude from the dashboard are the actual panel lights. These gauges aren't backlit. Instead, the light goes over top. Gasoline gauge, choke, hand throttle. Up above, there are no sun visors on either side, but there is a rear view mirror with a clock built into it, which is super nice. Windshield wiper is right there as well. There's only one windshield wiper for the driver's side. You'll see on both sides, these metal brackets, what look to be brackets, that if you unscrew that on both sides, the windshield will open. Best air conditioning system ever. Underneath the steering wheel, there is tons of space to put my hand in between my crotch and the steering wheel bottom. It is really nice in this car. Only enough room to put one other person in the front next to you, but there's a rumble seat in the back. But there's there's tons of there's more space in this than there is in my 52 Chevy truck from the steering wheel to my chest. My truck is wider than this, but and the headliner for the convertible top is a really nice fabric. The bars 
for the convertible the bars for the convertible top mechanism are wrapped insulated in that fabric which is a really nice touch behind the seat there is storage i guess you could call that a parcel shelf and that's what visibility would look like out the rear top up getting under the hood Flathead 6, got generator there, horn, starter, steering rack, which goes down into the steering box. Notice the coil is mounted right up on top. I'm sorry, notice the distributor is mounted right up on top in the center. Also notice it looks like... Also notice it looks like this has two separate heads. You see the split? That is interesting. The block, it's one block, but it has two separate heads. Interesting. And this is the intake and exhaust side. Notice it's an updraft carburetor. It's mounted way down low there. And the exhaust runs on top of it. This one's got a the um, gas pump as well as a fuel filter. And here's a better look at the head situation where you can see it's is clearly split. Man, a spark plug job on this would be so easy. Everything is just really accessible. On the positive side, this is a stellar car. I especially love the orange accenting color with the pinstripes and the wire wheels. For whatever reason, I'm missing footage on the day that I shot it, for whatever reason, the footage of the rumble seat was gone. But, it, but anyway, this was a stellar car with stellar interior. The seats were really nice. I'm pretty sure they were mohair, but they were soft mohair. They reminded me of the Windsor White Prince seats. It's not a huge car. It's got a mother-in-law seat, rumble seat with a trunk. The top had a nice headliner, which all the bars were wrapped in against it. Parts, people that know these cars inside and out are getting few and far between. All right, now it's time for Would You Rather, two scenarios today. In the first scenario, would you rather have a 1929 DeSoto Model K or 1929 Pontiac Model 6-29 or 1929 Essex Challenger? I'm going to leave this here for a minute. If you need more time, feel free. Pause the video. Moving on to the second scenario, 1929 Whippet or 1929 Pontiac or 1929 Plymouth Model U. Once again, gonna leave this here for a minute. If you need more time, feel free, pause the video. Now it's time for Name That Tune. First person to give both the name of the band and the song title correctly in the comment section will have their comment pinned to the top of it. Thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. If you'd like to get in touch with me, shoot me a comment in the comment section below, or you could always send me an email at what underscore it's underscore like at yahoo.com. I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you so much for making this an automotive community that I'm very much a part of. Until next time. Toodles.